So we want to get the basics in of reduction and oxidation reactions, which are a very common reaction in, in chemistry, and we want to kind of elucidate what's going on with them. So as we ended in lecture, uh, what we want to go through and do is identify them. So a reduction and oxidation reaction is any one that involves the transfer of electrons from one atom to another. And since electrons are charged, well, we would then clearly see in our reaction that charges would change. So if we go through and take a look at, say, that first species, the charge on it, as noted in the upper right-hand corner, which people seem to keep forgetting, so you have to start remembering that, is zero. And on the next one, it's also zero. And then on the next one, well, that one's zero. And the last one, that's also zero. So when we look at this, we say, well, the, the charge never changed, so clearly this cannot be a reduction and oxidation reaction. So why are we looking at it then? Okay, well, we're looking at it because the charge is not what's necessarily changing. It's the amount of electrons. And our charge applies to a unit, and under most circumstances, our units or our compounds will be neutral. Okay? What we have to do is actually look all the way in at the individual elements and see how they change. So let's pick calcium. Calcium in the reactant had a charge of zero. If we move to calcium in the product, okay, so now we have an interesting dilemma because before I had referenced the entire compound of calcium hydroxide. Now I just want to look at the calcium. We might say, well, but we don't know the charge. Well, according to our nomenclature rules, which you've spent time learning and figuring out and mastering, we do know the charge. We know the charge because hydroxide is a minus one because you memorized that. There's two of them. Whoops. Should probably put that two in a proper space. And we know our overall charge equals zero. Okay. And we know we have one calcium atom. So we can solve for the charge and we end up solving and finding out that the charge was a positive two. The other way is we realize that we memorized it off the periodic table. Well, why point this out? Well, what happened to the calcium in the course of this reaction? It went from a zero to a plus two. Okay. So its charge did change. So this is an example of an oxidation and reduction reaction. Okay, but it's hidden in the formulas, hidden in the reaction. So we actually have to dig deeper into our reactions to decide are they a, a redox reaction okay, or a reduction and oxidation reaction. So that's kind of our primer to it. And where this is really coming from is this new concept of an oxidation state. Believe it or not, we have already talked about it, except when we talked about it, we called it a charge, because charge, for some reason, we decide is easier to discuss than oxidation state. When we look at the calcium, it is starting at a zero oxidation state, or oxidation number, and it goes to a plus two oxidation number. Okay. And that is similar to our charge, but not the same thing. Okay, Same, but different, but still the same. Okay, So our state applies to the atom. Our charge applies to a unit. That unit could be an ion, in which case the charge and the oxidation state are the same thing. Okay, So it, it gets tricky. So the other part of this is you might start to think, well, how am I going to go through and calculate these things? Well, how did we determine the charge before? Okay, there was this fancy formula that we used in nomenclature. Okay, and you're like, that formula's bunk. I don't want to use that. I'm going to use this crossover method. And I told you that the crossover method was an awful, awful method and that you need to actually start thinking about this formula. Because if we look at this formula, when we used it, we actually said charge. Okay, and it wasn't charge. Hence, I put in the quotes. The charge on the cation, the charge on our anion, wasn't really a charge. It was actually the oxidation state. And what did this sum up to become? This summed up to become the charge. Not in quotes now. Okay? Because the sum of the oxidation states will get you to the charge. Okay? Lots of little bits of information came in through this. So let's take a look at some rules that, of course, go along with this. And everybody now panics because, oh my god, look at all these rules. Okay? But before we freak out, let's actually evaluate these rules. 
any atom in its elemental form has a zero oxidation state. So what we're saying is if the atom's all by itself, okay, in its natural form, say calcium solid, its oxidation state is zero. Okay, what was its charge? Well, its charge was also zero. Interesting. The charge in the oxidation state, sometimes the same. For any monatomic ion, the oxidation number equals the charge on that ion. Of course, the example I've got down here doesn't work, but what happens if we move to something like sodium chloride? Okay, we're saying the charge on the chloride is a minus one from our nomenclature rules. Well, what does this rule say? The oxidation number is the charge, so chloride is a minus one oxidation number in this form. Okay, so if we're looking at our ions, the charge and the oxidation state are the same. Nonmetals are usually negative, okay, and this one gets a bit uh, tricky for us. Remember, the biggest part of this is usually negative, and probably the most critical one to memorize is that one. Oxygen will have a minus two oxidation state, okay. The rest of them you pretty much have to calculate, okay. Uh, hydrogen is typically a plus one, except when it's bound to a metal, okay, and when it's bound to a metal, it's a minus one. And then halides are typically a minus one, except when they're counter to 3A. Okay, so oxygen will always have a minus two. And again, there's exceptions to that, but we won't see those, so don't worry about those. And then the last part is that the sum of the oxidation numbers will equal the charge in the molecule, which is a really important formula. So I would argue that it all simplifies down to really three things. Know your charges from your ionic compounds, both the metal and the nonmetal. Oxygen will always have a minus two, and then we need this formula. Okay, so if we actually go through our rules, well, rule three, I told you to use in nomenclature. So that's not a new rule. Okay, uh, know the charges from your ionic compounds. I told you to do that in nomenclature as well. So that's not a new rule. Oxygen will have a minus two oxidation state. Okay, I would kind of argue that's not a new rule either, because I did tell you that oxygen was a minus two and you needed to know that. Except I said it was charge, not oxidation state. Now I'm telling you it's oxidation state. Fair enough, you have one new rule to memorize. That's it. If you've been doing what I asked you to do, there's only one more rule, not that hard. So let's take a look at some examples. Charge is the numerical representation of the ion imbalance in a unit. So we have to look at a unit to evaluate it. Oxidation state is the numerical representation of the subatomic particles in an element. So this is our balance of protons and electrons. So let's take a look at some units when we're looking at our charge. So we'll look at the first two, and then you can solve the second two on your own. So if we look at that one, well, the charge is the numerical representation in the unit, and the charge is always specified in the upper right-hand corner, which means when I look at the charge on this unit, which happens to be just copper by itself, its charge is zero. If I ask you for the charge on the next unit of nitrate, well, the charge is again written in the upper right-hand corner. It is a minus one. Okay, that's it. That's charge. Okay, interestingly enough, you will find that I have never asked you for the charge on the nitrogen in nitrate. And the reason why is nitrogen is part of the unit. I can't ask that question. Okay, it's not a fair question to ask. Okay, nitrogen is not charged in nitrate. It has an oxidation state. And so to ask that question, I have to change the phrasing to make sure I'm referencing the oxidation state. Okay, so take a minute here. So I'm going to pause uh, my talking. So hopefully you're able to figure out the charge on both the sulfate and the copper, or the copper ion, I should say. And now we can move to our oxidation state, okay, which gets a little bit trickier. So it is our numerical representation of the subatomic particles in an element. So this can require a calculation. Sometimes you can do it by just looking at it, okay? But we're going to solve 
the calculation all the way through uh, as necessary. So let's take a look at our first unit. Our first unit is copper. Okay, copper all by itself. Okay, in this case, since it's all by itself and it is just the element, that unit is also the atom, okay, or the element in this compound. Okay, which means I'm solving for the exact same thing. So we'll go back to our calculation. The number of the element, well, in that unit, how many times does the copper element show up? Well, it showed up once. Its oxidation state, okay, and this is one of the things I would say you always have to solve for, is X. I don't know what it is. Okay, plus the number of the next element, well, there isn't one. Okay, and I would repeat this for every single element, so plus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that then equals the overall charge on that compound. Well, remember, the charge was always given to you in the upper right-hand corner. And in that right-hand corner, I have nothing written, so it is a zero. I can now solve my equation, and I end up getting x equals zero. So the oxidation state, or the oxidation number, for copper, in elemental copper, is zero. Remember that rule and that big list of things that your textbook likes to throw at you? The very first rule, you solved for it. Okay? You don't have to memorize it. It's already there. It's already part of you going through and working through it. Okay? So let's try the next one. Okay? Because the next one's, of course, going to get trickier. I want to know the oxidation state for each of the elements in nitrate. Okay? So nitrate has two elements. Okay? one unit. So I would go through and set up my equation just the same. The number of the element, well the first one is nitrogen, so there's one nitrogen there, times its oxidation state, which we said we should always have to solve for, plus the number of the next element, well there's three oxygens, times its oxidation state, and again I said we always have to solve for it, so let's try and solve for it equals the overall charge, and our overall charge is again written in the upper right hand corner, must equal now a minus one. And here's where we kind of differ from how we've been using our, nomencl our nomenclature formula. In our nomenclature formula, our overall charge was always zero. It's not the case necessarily when looking at oxidation states. We can solve for charged species. So we now have our equation, okay? and as we've discussed in the past, this equation is now going to be impossible to solve definitively. And that's because I have two variables and one equation. Okay? But this is where that memorization comes in. I told you that you need to memorize that the oxidation state, or Y in this case, for oxygen must be minus 2. Well, if Y is minus 2, I can then sub that into my equation and what ends up happening? Okay, well, I would get x minus 6 equals minus 1. I can rearrange, group similar terms, bring the 6 over to the other side, and I end up saying that x equals plus 5. Okay? So, to summarize that then all underneath, so I'm going to erase some of this work, I said that the oxidation state for the nitrogen is a plus 5, the oxidation state for the oxygen is a minus 2. Okay? I need to be able to identify these, otherwise I can't actually do a redox reaction. So again, we've got two more questions to go through and solve. I want you to determine the oxidation states for copper ion and copper plus 2 ion. I also want you to determine the oxidation state for sulfur and sulfate, and the oxidation state for oxygen and sulfate. So go ahead and answer that quiz question. Our charges again added to it, shown in the upper right hand corner. There were the answers we just summarized for the copper and the nitrate. And look at that, I didn't tell you your answers for your copper and your sulfate. Tough. Okay, so how do we use this in a reaction? Well, we need to go through and determine the oxidation state for every single element in every single place it shows up in a reaction. So if we go through and look at the above reaction, iodine shows up in two places. Once in I2O5 as a reactant and once in I2. 
what you should be able to go through and do is confirm that the oxidation states that I listed here are correct for each of those elements. Which brings us to the last part on determining our redox reactions. We now need to look to see how our oxidation state changed in the course of the reaction. Okay? I went from a plus 5 to a 0. Okay? How do I go from a positive number to a smaller number? Well, I had to add negative charge. Okay? I had to add electrons. So what happened in this case? I gained electrons. Okay, well, what happened in the next case? Oxygen minus 2 to oxygen minus 2. Well, I didn't change the electrons at all, so nothing, nothing happened. Okay. And the last one, which of course I'm now going to throw in as a quiz question here, what happens as we go from carbon plus 2 to carbon plus 4? Okay, as we process and put this all together, okay, what we should have noticed, whoops, is that to go from a plus 2 to a plus 4, I had to lose electrons. Okay, and yes, this seems a bit odd because I'm losing negative charge, and by losing negative charge, I become more positive, hence the number becoming larger and larger. So when we're looking at our redox reactions, we then summarize and invent a new word because gaining electrons and losing electrons is clearly not scientific enough, and we end up adding these extra definitions. The loss of an electron is oxidation, or the gain of electrons is reduction. The mnemonic device that I personally like to memorize this is Leo says Gur, okay? where Leo is a lion, right? That's the zodiac symbol. Okay? Leo the lion says grr. That helps me remember that the oxidation is tied back to a loss of electrons, that the reduction is tied back to a gain of electrons, because all of my letters kind of match in there. Okay? That's helpful for me. It may not be helpful for you to memorize it, but you do need to memorize it. The other one that seems to be floating around this campus, because when I got here, everybody was like, what does Leo say? I don't understand that at all. You might see this one. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons or oil rig. I think that's a load of nonsense because it doesn't even involve the symbol of electrons. But to each his own, if that or her own for that matter, if that works for you, then great, stick with it. Okay? And with that, I think we're actually done with this video. We are. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on Tuesday.